we did this photo session and she sat me down afterwards and said, I'm not deleting these. You have got to look at them. Mm. And she sat me down on the bed and opened up the camera and, and flicked back to, to this, this particular set of photos. And let's just say it was profound. You know, it was, it was like looking in the mirror for the very first time and finally seeing me looking back. Hello and welcome to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. We get curious about all things gender, sex and sexuality, as well as relationships, feminism, the inclusive kind, mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. If you like what we do and want to make a contribution, you can become a patron on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender, or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. Now join us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I am a queer woman and my pronouns are she and they. In this episode, I have a conversation with Claire Prochot. Claire's pronouns are she and her, and she is a transgender woman. Find out what that means to Claire in this episode. We also talk about the lack of female role models in the 70s, trying to reconcile the expected side and the authentic side of us, the entanglement of gender, mental health and neurodivergence, feeling like yourself for the first time, reframing gendered activities, identifying as versus identifying with, gender alignment rather than transition, and having more stories to tell. To clarify some terminology that is used in the episode, GIC is Gender Identity Clinic. Please be aware that there is mention of suicide in this episode. It was recorded on the 22nd of March, 2022. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? Hi Esther, my name's Claire Prosho. I run a small uh, trans awareness organisation called Claire's Transgender Talks. Awesome. Welcome Claire. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Yeah, so I'm so glad you're here. So, um, yeah, let's talk, let's talk a bit about gender, as we do here. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the label you gave me was transgender woman. So what was it like for you to discover that about yourself, I guess, what you could call it? Yeah, um, obviously, as a late transitioner, I mean, I'm in my early 50s, so I only actually came out about five years or so, five, six years ago now, um, end of 2016, right. after a fairly extensive period exploring who I was. Um, I mean, it's a huge, huge, long story, but yeah, in short, as many late transitioners do, quite difficult. I found it quite difficult and there was a lot to overcome, but mm. it opened my eyes completely and, you know, I mean, we, I know we kind of say, you know, we're the same person as we transition, but quite often we're really not. Mm. We're, you know, we can be very, end up being very, very different people. And I think it's important to, to recognize that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in my own case, personally, and, and, and with my relationship with, with my wife, it's improved things massively. It, it's been a real journey and kind of working all of that out you know I, I kind of ended up well <laughs> where to start really it's kind of one of these circular stories I'll kind of come back to I suppose when I first came out and how that happened really I think mm -hmm. it, might be, it might be the best place because you know I mentioned I'd been exploring things for about 10 12 years and that kind of all came about because I've I've suffered from nervous breakdowns and, and, and had breakdowns and depression and things my entire life, ever since I was sort of 10, 11 years old. Wow, and yeah. I had a really serious illness back in 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. and I'd been suppressing everything at that point and mm -hmm. just mentally locking things away in my mind. You know, i am potentially got autism. Uh, and I'm very good at compartmentalizing things. So mm. crammed things into a box, smart gender, tried to be the best man I could be. And that box just kind of got full to overflowing. And mm. 
as I said, I, I, I got ill in 2005, 2006. And it took about 11 months for them to, to diagnose what was wrong with me. Um, mm-hmm. And I had gallstones. Right. But it was, it was the type of gallstones that apparently could kill you, which I found yeah. out about two, three years afterwards um, because they wow. can migrate. And the amount of pain I was in, I mentally started suppressing all of that as well because I was so good at suppressing everything. Wow. I suppressed the amount of pain I was in. Mm. And that just kind of put the cracks in that box you know, and that wall that I'd built up to, to hide who I was. Mm-hmm. And exploring who I was became a relief in some ways, an outlet in some ways from what I was feeling and experiencing. You know, and, and at that point, you know, over that kind of 10 years or so, yeah, I applied all, all of the, the labels that we don't like to look at and apply now, you know, cross-dresser, fetishist, you know, the amount of self-loathing mm. that I had to work through because of those labels was incredible. You know, and it was mm. just, you know, I loved playing dress up, as I called it back then. Mm-hmm. Um, which had only happened sort of like once a month. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd get a chance to kind of explore being being who I was. And then everything went back in a box. And then a month later, come back out, went back in the box. But mm-hmm. over that 10 years, it gradually progressed to, to a point where my wife and I would go for weekends away. And mm-hmm. I would start fully expressing who I was in, in mm-hmm. the hotel rooms that we had and she would start taking pictures of me mm-hmm. which I still wouldn't look at wouldn't look at myself mm-hmm. in the mirror over those 10 years hated the person I saw in the mirror wouldn't mm-hmm. look at these photos and they all got kind of deleted until December 2016 I think it was 2nd December 2016 wow. so yeah, I actually remember the date mm-hmm. and I mean, the funny thing was, is we'd, we'd been out shopping that day and my wife had found a, a dress that she thought I would look quite good in. And dirt cheap, party dress things, just like, yeah, it's a mm-hmm. bit of fun. We'll throw it away when it's done kind of thing. Covered in mm-hmm. glitter, it's all glittery and, and, and whatnot. <laughs> nice. And yeah. she was like, no, nah, you're going to wear that. We do, we're going to do a couple of photo sessions. We'll do that. You can wear that. And... We did this photo session. We had a lovely hotel suite because we used to kind of really tw- uh, treat ourselves. Mm-hmm. And she sat me down afterwards and said, I'm not deleting these. You've got to look at them. Mm-hmm. And she sat me down on the bed and opened up the camera and, and flicked back to, to this, this particular set of photos. And let's just say it was profound you know it was it was like looking in the mirror for the very first time and finally seeing me looking back Mm -hmm. and of course absolutely euphoric at that point and i was i was on a massive high for about a week and Mm. then it all came crashing down because i've had to go from seeing who I was back to male mode. Mm-hmm. And even though I was quite androgynously dressing at the time, I was kind of incorporating feminine aspects into who I was on a daily basis anyway. But it just brought everything kind of to the fore. Mm. And I had another I had another nervous breakdown um just after Christmas. And at this point I was massively suicidal. Mm. And nobody wanted to help. Mm. You know, I, I, I tried seeking help through um, through a work wellness scheme, and, and they basically refused. Local mental health charities refused. Went to the oh. GP to try and get a referral and see if I could get some counselling. Again, refused to refer me to a GIC at that point, and basically mm. went have some depress. Here's some antidepressants. Have those instead. Um, you're just dealing with personal problems. And mm. that just sent me into a massive downward spiral. Mm-hmm. But it also gave me the impetus to actually 
rather than give up, to seek some help on my own. Unfortunately, I was I was in a position to do so. And after about a month's research, I found a gender counsellor who was relatively local, who mm-hmm. had some good good reports and good reviews from from other local trans people I'd spoken to. And I spent six months with her mm-hmm. working everything. I say working everything out because actually the gender stuff was an absolute doddle. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the irony of it. You know, I spent six months with a gender counsellor and I think we, we talked about gender and my own gender and exploring who I was probably like sort of three, four, five times. Wow. And the rest um, was unpacking other things. Ev- yeah. Everything else was unpacking mm what turned out to be some pretty extensive trauma that went right back to my childhood. Mm. And, you know, um, and, and this, this is the kind of stuff that quite often gets used against us as trans people. You know, oh, you're traumatized, mm. therefore you're trans. It's the trauma right. that's made you trans. Yeah. But that's not the case. Well, it's certainly not mm. the case for me, and I very much doubt it's the case for any trans person. You know, mm. I mean, in in my own case, I kind of found that, and some of this is still quite difficult to talk about, but my mum was quite emotionally abusive. Mm-hmm. You know, she was very controlling and things like that, and it's mm-hmm. that's that that's putting it very mildly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, I, I kind of suspect from that that she had some issues of her own. Now, um, it's always the way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both yeah. both in terms potentially of her sexuality. But I think she was bipolar and mm. undiagnosed bipolar. But because of who she was and how she was, and because I grew up in the 1970s, you know, I, I kind of worked out from this therapy that I first started feeling different, probably about seven years old. Mm. You know, and I can kind of go back and look back now and kind of go, these are all the signs that showed that actually I wasn't the boy everybody thought I was, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it, it, and some of it's silly things, you know, you, you look at, you look for role models, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in things that you, things that you watch on TV and in books you read and things like that. And, you know, growing up in the seventies, there weren't many female role models, mm-hmm. but I'd sit there and I mean, I love Thunderbirds, for example, and a lot of the yeah. Jerry Anderson stuff. And I was always more interested in what Lady Penelope was doing and saw myself as Lady Penelope than I did with any of the guys running around doing all the rescue stuff. Right. And and likewise with, um, I think it was either Joe 90 or UFO with the, the Angel Interceptors, the female fighter pilots. I was always more interested in what they were doing yeah. than, than the main guys in Captain Scarlet, I think it was, actually. Uh, but mm-hmm. what the main guys were doing in, in fighting the Mysterons. Mm. Um, Penelope Pitstop in Wacky Races was another one. Uh, mm. And, yeah, so, so all these little kind of clues. And I was mm. always more kind of drawn to what girls were wearing, but I knew I couldn't be like that. I wasn't mm. allowed to express myself in that way. Yeah. So I kind of, I think, started shutting down things quite early on because it was unacceptable. Mm. Yeah, and the media landscape back then was horrific, you know, mm. in terms of trans representation. You know, it's not yeah. great now, but it was, you know, the only time you saw people potentially like me were figures of fun, you know, people cross dressing mm. for fun and had been being taken the mick out of and you know, dressing as the opposite sex was a big punchline. Mm. Yeah. You know, and and yeah. When you're sort of seven, eight, nine years old, that that sticks. You know, that person as to who you are and how you want to express yourself, that that kind of sticks. Mm. But I also didn't have the language, you know, and not uncommon in the 70s, you know, around what trans is and and, and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. And I didn't really kind of put two and two together, I think, at a a younger age until I was about 10 years old. Mm. And... That was down to um, a newspaper expose about Caroline Cossey, mm-hmm. who was, um, I think, known as Tula at the time. She was a model and an actress at the time. 
mm-hmm. and she was in the the James Bond film for your eyes only mm-hmm. uh, and i and I distinctly remember I think it was like a big big two page spread with Tula in a bikini there from from the movie completely out in her the language was atrocious the you know the um the way she was talked about was was horrific yeah but that was the first time i saw someone like that and and little 10 year old me basically went seriously that's an option you can do that Mm -hmm. you can change your body in that way you can change sex Mm -hmm. but at the same time also when you're never going to be able to do it just shut it down Mm -hmm. and and i did so yeah and this Mm -hmm. was kind of around the 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 time puberty was kicking in and Mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff so uh, i just locked everything away as i said and it was only mm. through this 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 therapy that i had which which was invaluable that it kind of uncovered all of this going way way back and how can i put this i think all i was really waiting for even though i'd been exploring things for about 10 years you know and i'd kind of got to the point in in that december where i'd basically i think i'd kind of almost convinced myself I was gender fluid at that point. Mm-hmm. But I think again, in hindsight, I was, I was trying to reconcile two sides of me, like a public side that was expected mm-hmm. and the side of me that actually is authentic. Um, yeah. And I was still kind of bouncing between two worlds and that, that line was becoming increasingly blurred, mm-hmm. but I was still trying to kind of satisfy two opposing groups, if you will. And that counselling was almost like giving me permission to be who I am. You know, that's mm. why I kind of needed to hear it from somebody that wasn't a trans person that I'd been talking to, wasn't my wife. I wasn't out to family at this point at all. Mm-hmm. And and my my counsellor, Nicola, she was just like, I think we, we was about four months in, I think, at this point and doing weekly sessions and she was she was like okay i want to see claire next week wow and i was like really really and she's like yeah i don't want to see you like this anymore i want to see claire next week i want to talk to claire Mm. and that was the first time i went out in public so just in the car car drive down to where she was and i was on top of the world Mm. i was absolutely on top of the world and i kind of haven't looked back since really you know it it, it took like a probably another couple of years to put the whole gender fluid bit in you know in context and and kind of Mm. really work out that the label that really fitted me or the badge that really fitted me i don't like labels as in you know the boxes Mm. Um, yeah it's more kind of an indicator for me a signpost Mm was woman, trans woman, fairly binary, trans woman. Mm-hmm. And that's, I've been kind of progressing that ever since. You know, I, 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 mm-hmm. I suppose I kind of started living more authentically about three years ago, four years ago. Went through a period, or came out at work, which, which went well in some respects and absolutely terribly in others. Mm. Um, and ended up leaving leaving that job to due to being abused, um, transphobically wow. abused. But that gave me the impetus to start my own little business. And yeah, I've, I've kind of gradually been working towards being myself on a day to day basis over the last kind of three or four years. And I'm happier than ever. I mean, this is this is the mad thing about it, you know, is you come out, you lose friends, you lose family, you gain loads of other friends and, and people to kind of talk to and, and that support you. But it's a, it's a big adjustment. It's a huge adjustment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, you mentioned as well, like what, what I really, what really stood out for me was like actually something you said in the beginning it's not like you kind of change when you come out, but you kind of do. It's like you, it, yeah. from from what I've seen people say, it's like they become more of themselves, but obviously 
I guess it might seem very different because of like we we perform so much, you know, in yeah. in our roles like gender roles and in our lives and like being being partners and employees and all the things, you know, that we yeah. do. So oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's um, mm. it's kind of mad when you think about it. Really, it's re- it's really kind of crazy stuff. You know, you, you put yourself into this this other box to try and mm. satisfy other people even though it mm. denies who you are. And, mm. I mean, for me, the, you know, the, the result of that was, I mean, this, this was one, one factor amongst a few, as, as it turned out, but I wasn't a particularly nice person. You know, mm. I, it, it hurts to admit it. And, you know, I, I still kind of look back now and think, you were an absolute arse sometimes, <laughs> a lot of the time, actually. Um, mm. But it wasn't really me. You know, mm. it was it was trying to perform something that that didn't fit at all. Mm. Not just didn't fit partially; it just didn't fit at all. It was the pain and depression of having to deal with that and live that every day, of mm. hiding who you really are every day. You know that that old me, that me that everybody kind of thought they knew, wasn't mm. me. Yeah. But that makes it harder for people who know you to adjust because they think it is you. Yeah, that makes so um, much sense. Yeah. But, you know, uh, uh, you know and we, we talked about, you know, mentioned ADHD at the beginning, you know, sorting mm-hmm. out the, what I found for me, and, and I know this isn't uncommon in, in the trans community, but mm-hmm. sorting out the trans stuff for me, putting, putting that to bed and getting that on a path to actually kind of going, this is who you really are. Now, mm. how do you make it work? Which is a different set of parameters, really. Let me see mm. that I was still having issues. Mm. You know, I was still, I was still experiencing problems. I still felt suicidal. I was, my moods were all over the place. You yeah. know, I was having trouble coping at work. I was having trouble coping at home. Everything was still completely overwhelming. Mm. And I was kind of getting active on Twitter at this point and kind of finding out a bit more information. Mm. Uh, and, and that's where I came across kind of ADHD and autism Twitter. Mm. And just just following a few people there with symptoms and, and manifestations that were similar to mine mm-hmm. kind of let me see that actually something else definitely was going on. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't put all the train stuff in in context first. It was just mm. too messy. Yeah, so you had to um, unpick things that all these yeah. separate elements that were like all intertwined. Yeah, yeah. So it, mm. it was like you know this, this big box that had me in it in my mind wasn't just trains. It mm. was trains, ADHD, ASD. And some other bits and bobs and trauma and whatnot all kind of crammed mm. together in this big mess. So mm. kind of unraveling the train stuff and kind of going, yeah, put that in a box over there. That's kind of almost sorted, but yeah. the box is open rather than shut. And I can yeah. kind of play with it as I need to. Then mm. let me start unpacking the rest of that box. Mm. And being kind of the logical person that I am, I started looking at the ADHD side of things. I knew something was going on. Actually, I didn't start off looking at ADHD, which was the funny thing. I thought I was bipolar because Mm. of the mood swings and everything else. Yeah. But I spent about six months tracking my mood, sleep, and about 10 different things. Mm -hmm. Went to the doctors in, oh, when was it? About 2019, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was May 2019. Might have been May 2020. I'm a little bit hazy on the actual date, but it was one of these mental health awareness weeks. Um, Mm. And I had six months worth of data, as Mm. well as some health tests around bipolar, ADHD, ASD, and a few other bits and pieces. Mm. (laughs) Put a folder together. I went to see my GP and just went, something else is going on here. Have a look at that. Give me some help. Mm. (laughs) And he just sort of went, "Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there's definitely something wrong here. We'll, uh, we'll we'll pass you over for a referral. That was 
an interesting experience and not in a pleasant way. Mental health services are rubbish where I am, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Well, you're not the first I've heard say that, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, they, they did all the kind of usual stuff you expect to see happen when you're trans and you're dealing with a mental health issue. You know, they, they mm. tried to blame what I was going through on being trans, mm-hmm. even though I clearly told them that that wasn't the case. They ignored all of the evidence that I gathered um, mm. and tried going down a completely different path until I kicked off and I, I kicked off big time. And I actually got to see a proper psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. And she sat there. We had this chat. She sat there and went, do this self-test, which is one I'd already done previously. Mm-hmm. Looked at it and went, I think you've got ADHD. I'm going to refer you for a proper assessment. And mm-hmm. it took about two years or so. And um, it was only oh, about September 2021, September, October 2021. I finally got the written diagnosis confirmed I had ADHD Mm. and I've got combined type ADHD as well, which makes it doubly worse because it means I bounce between interactive and uh, sorry, hyperactive and inattentive, Mm. which is a source of a lot of the issues that I was having. You know, one Mm. minute I could focus on things next minute. I couldn't, Mm. then I'd get interested in things and drop hobby and uh, it was just a complete and total mess. Yeah. <laughs> and they they put me on medication. I went with these, one of these slow release stimulants uh, that they put you on. And it, it, it took about six months to get the dosage right. Mm. But almost immediately with that, it was like, hang on, this is having an effect. You know, I didn't even realize I had all this noise in my head. Mm. And then this i mean I, I remember this vividly the second i took that first tablet within like about an hour all that noise vanished mm. and i was like hang on you've been living with that noise in your head for 50 odd years mm. and now it's quiet wow and i could focus on things that i wanted to focus on Mm. and 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 do things that i wanted to do you know and and again that that revealed some other issues you know executive Mm. dysfunction i have terrible problems with executive dysfunction making choices to do things and turns out i've also got an audio sensory issue as well Mm. which tends to overwhelm me in combination with it but working that little bit out and getting medicated on the right medication for that bit Mm. then let me develop strategies and ways of coping with those bits. And then that Mm. all kind of loops back to the trains stuff again, because now I kind of got that sorted out. Yeah. It was like, okay, I'm definitely a trans woman. Where do I need to go with my transition? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to live my life as the the best, as the person I am? Mm. And it gave me that space. So, you know, it's this, this, this big exploration and all these messy issues Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm still waiting for an autism diagnosis because, again, there's there's some stuff in and around that, a lot of lot of tells in and around that, and I've been referred for that, and I'm I'm waiting for that, and I know the wait list for that is quite long. Right. But with kind of the two biggest ones kind of put aside now and sort partially sorted, mm-hmm. it let me circle back with a space with the train stuff to go. What do I need to do now? Where do I need mm. to go with this? Um, how am I going to progress my life as I want to live it? Mm. And that's where I started self meding So, I mean, mm. the first, before, I mean, before I did that, I um, I finally got my referral to GIC sorted with mm. the GP. Um, mm. But that was only back in 2020, no, end of 2020. Um, and they messed all that up, but I, you know, I won't go into that. It's a huge, horrible story. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm on the waiting list officially at this point. Yeah. But it took me about another year to kind of go, actually, I think I'm ready to, tr- to try hormones and start on hormones. Mm-hmm. And I was more interested in the mental health benefits. Mm-hmm. You know, in, mm-hmm. in this, this whole, I know it's, it's very anecdotal amongst the community. 
and mm. uh, you know the first thing you notice is is improvements to your mental or you can notice is improvements to your mental health um mm. your mood and, and and things like this and, and my mood was still all over the place even even medicated with my adhd stuff and even coping much, right. much better so it's like yeah i've got to try it so I, ma- I managed to source about three months worth of estrogen patches mm. off the net just just a let's try it not even bother with testosterone blocking at this point mm-hmm. stick a patch on and, and see how it feels yeah um and 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 i mean my my rationale around this was anyway my, my wife had recently started hrt as well for an issue oh, and yeah. my rationale was well we can try it at the same time and right. if i find i don't get on with it she can have the patches as a as a backup very practical so, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm I'm fairly yeah. practical and, and she's eminently practical. So yeah. um so it was like yeah, kind of a bit of a twofer, really, a bit of a win win situation. Yeah. And you know, these patches turned up and I, I I didn't even hesitate putting that first patch on. Wow. So did you I mean, how did you decide on the, the dosage? Did you just pick something? I just went with the same dosage that she was using. Wow. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, which was, I mean, I, I, I did a little bit of research and it was apparently the most common dosage. Um, mm. It's like 3.2 mg um, per patch twice a week. But I wasn't expecting really to see anything because I wasn't test, I wasn't blocking testosterone. Yeah, right, right. And I didn't really notice anything for the first week. Mm. You know, so yeah, patches there, but got that first week out of the way and literally that second week it was like oh hang on this feels nice (laughs) but it was nice in the way that i felt like me for the first time Mm. that was the kind of the most profound thing it's like is this what it feels like to be me because I, i kind of felt connected Mm. whereas i felt disconnected my entire life you know kind of emotionally and 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 you know sensation and, and, and things like that i boxed and hid everything away you know i really mm-hmm. disconnected you know, that was how i coped i disconnected yeah and it, even starting to socially transition and, and and using my name and things like that that had rebuilt some of those connections mm. but literally a week's worth of estrogen was like suddenly all of those connections kind of started firing at once Mm. And there was this this massive sensation of calm. Wow! I just went massively calm. There was like a a clarity that I didn't have before, and it was so profound. Mm. Yeah, you know, it was just so that calming effect was just like, yeah, this is this feels more like me. This mm. feels like me, you know. And I pooled on for a couple of months doing that. And then I thought, do you know what? I need to get this sorted properly. I can't afford mm-hmm. can't afford to go private. Mm-hmm. But I need to sort a bridging prescription. Mm-hmm. See if I can chance my arm and get go to the GP and, and, and get hormones and HRT on the NHS, which if you're trans you, you kind of know and and you know that it's it's quite that can be quite fraught. Um, it's very mm. much done at a GP's discretion. Mm-hmm. And I kind of sat there and sort of like, well, why do I want this? And, you know, the first thought was obviously physical changes, mental mm-hmm. health changes to continue. But then I realized something really profound at that point that I hadn't even noticed had happened. Mm-hmm. You know, now, I, I've mentioned feeling suicidal a couple of points mm-hmm. during this. Mm-hmm. I kind of already tracked that back to low key when I was about 10, 11 years old. Mm-hmm. So I kind of had continual low key suicidal thoughts my entire life. So about 40 mm-hmm. odd years of, of, of suicidal thoughts. And in that two months I'd started taking estrogen before I went to the GP, those suicidal thoughts had almost completely disappeared. Wow. And I hadn't even noticed. Mm. You know, I'd gone from I'd, I'd been gone from 
from thinking suicidal thoughts almost every day for mm. my entire life since puberty, you know, since 10, 11 years old, mm. to suddenly they weren't there. And I hadn't even noticed. <laughs> and I was luckily enough, I, I, I have a fairly supportive GP who I'm working with, took over the estrogen side of things, wrote to a local endocrinologist, uh, and got me on testosterone blockers as well. Right. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been on a proper HRT regime now since last November, so November 2021. Mm. And that has been game-changing. That mm. really has been game-changing, you know. And, and not just talking the physical stuff, because, yeah, I'm starting to see physical changes, mm -hmm. which is really nice, frankly. Yeah. You know, I look in the mirror now and physically I'm kind of starting to see me. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to see the person I've had in my head all my life physically. Yeah, you know, I, I, facially I kind of definitely got some dysphoria around, around you know facial stuff, um, mm. but it's even starting to happen there. You know, there's been kind of some softening of features, and yeah, my, shul my shoulders have dropped a little, which I've, you know, I don't feel as broad shoulders as I did previously. I mean, there was <laughs> funny funny story involved in that because this is just after about three four months you know yeah um i hit i hit one week and all of a sudden my bra straps all started falling off in the space of about two weeks and oh, i was wow. like what's going on here because you know they're all set <laughs> to the same size and, and things like this yeah. and i had to tighten them all up because my shoulders have changed slightly already and it's How like interesting. okay that's interesting uh -huh. You know, having to wear a bra regularly now um, mm -hmm. because I need the support. But mm -hmm. then, yeah, those those changes are all kind of there. But really, the most significant thing was is those suicidal thoughts stopped completely. And That's you know, I haven't had um, I haven't had a suicidal thought pretty much in about eight months now. Wow, that's that's a profound change, isn't it? And I was also Which interested to hear. Yeah. And what you said about when it started, when you're about 10 or 11, do you mm. think that was very closely linked to, I don't know, maybe gender dysphoria and, and puberty starting? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, 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 I mean, we do know scientifically. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I call it a non-traditional route in exploring myself and, and who I was, you know, it's mm -hmm. when I kind of worked out, I was trans, you know, after seeing this, this, this picture. Mm -hmm. I um I started digging into the science of it rather than kind mm -hmm. of talking to other trans people and doing experiences and things like that. I actually went down the scientific route because I'm I'm quite a logical person and I like evidence, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And every bit of evidence I found said there's a biological root cause to what you're going through. This is mm -hmm. simply who you are. Mm -hmm. And and part of that was finding out that actually not every trans person knows from a very young age mm -hmm. but you know we've, we've got studies that show that around half of trans people realize they're trans from puberty onwards mm. in whatever manifestation that takes mm. and that was very much the case for me that was that trigger point puberty was that trigger point it was almost like there were latent features in my brain there waiting for estrogen to activate them. And when mm -hmm. they got hit with testosterone, it was just like, no, this doesn't work. You know, it's mm -hmm. um, an analogy I, I've, I've used with, with others when, I'm, when I've been kind of talking about trans things with, with, with cisgender people. It's like trying to run a petrol car on diesel. Mm. you've got yeah. the wrong fuel going in it might work for a bit but it will run very very badly and you won't get anything like the performance out of it that that you would yeah. um would expect uh, uh, and vice versa if if it's the other way around mm. uh, and and that's what estrogen did for me you know it was like suddenly mm -hmm. i was running on the right fuel mm-hmm yeah. and everything just started making sense everything just started working properly Mm. My confidence has gone through the roof. 
Mm-hmm. Even with the ADHD and things like that, you know, my confidence has gone through the roof. Mm-hmm. Um, and all because I feel like me. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and, and it, it's been a slow process. You know, it, it's, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to kind of deny that. But I've yeah. had a lot to work out. I've had a lot to work through. Yeah. Um, and I'm not done yet. Mm. You know, it's, it, it's an ongoing process. Transition is an ongoing process. Mm. But working out those, like working through those labels, you know, what mm-hmm. fits, what doesn't fit, you know, identified, as I said, as non-binary for a while. Mm. Because at the time, that fit. But, yeah. you know, some people, that's, that, that's their lives. That's who they are. Yeah. For me, it was a transitional step. Yeah. Yeah. But, that makes sense. You know, yeah, it all led back to puberty so I, I i kind of get it i understand it mm. and yeah it, it's fascinating stuff really yeah it sounds it i mean from what you're saying it sounds like when the hormones started kicking in and they were kind of like you say the wrong fuel it sounds like having the wrong fuel in there amplified like the disconnect or the dysphoria yeah. or the so that j- just took on a whole like it expanded perhaps for you where your mental health just was really affected in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that is a, that is a really good way of putting it. It, 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 mm-hmm. it was, and I, I know people kind of liken it to, to poison and, and things like that, but it's, you know, for me, mm-hmm. it was more a case of, yeah, it was, it, it amplified all the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. It amplified mm-hmm. the disconnect. It amplified the emotional disconnect that I, you know, that I had. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm made me feel out of control Mm. and Mm. I didn't like any of that and I didn't Mm. realize I didn't like any of that is more more to the point you know yeah Um, because you said you didn't have the language for any of it either did you yeah yeah that's right and it's Mm. only by by that exploration process you know and I acknowledge you know for me it was quite slow but that slowness, I think, benefited my relationship mm-hmm. in many, many ways. Because you know, I, I, I've kind of mentioned my wife a couple of points, but yeah. she has been—if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't still be here. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not, not not just talking me as in transitioning. I'm talking me as a person. Mm-hmm. Know, she's been that that rock, that, that central focal point that I can always come back to mm. when I'd lost myself and when I was losing myself and, and out of control. Um, wow. yeah. But she was always more than that as well. Mm-hmm. She was always the one that was encouraging me to explore things, encouraging mm. me to try new things, you know, to try and express things in a different way but at a pace I was comfortable with, but at a pace that she was also comfortable with as well, because, mm. you know, we're married. We've been married since 1992. I've, I've known her since I was 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've, we've been together for 30 years this year, as in married, and mm. about 35, 36 years as a couple. And she's, she stood by me the whole way and she's helped every step of the Mm. way and i think that that slow that slow process that slow exploration helped her understanding as well Mm -hmm. and i think it's one of these things that's helped us stay together right in terms of understanding and and you know we're we're still very much a very very happy couple relationships things change as you get older anyway mm-hmm. but ours has become stronger you know between us ours has become much much stronger and, that's really beautiful yeah and and i mean i'm i'm doing stuff now that i never if you told me 20 years ago that you know i'd be doing some of this stuff i would have laughed at you know but we 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 do things like you know we've we've gone to art galleries Mm-hmm. which I would, I would have just like, nah, not interested. You know, mm. take me to a car show instead kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but, 
yeah, so seriously. Um, yeah. You know, we, we do things like that. I've taken up new hobbies. You know, I do, I, I cross stitch, um, mm-hmm. which I, I really enjoy. Movies have always been a thing for, for the pair of us. We you know that mm-hmm. right going right back to when we were dating. And mm-hmm. that taste in movies has stayed the same in some ways, mm-hmm. but in others has changed very, very kind of drastically, you know, and I used to hate mm. rom-coms, for example. You know, I just flat out <laughs> would not watch a rom-com um, or any romantic movie whatsoever, you know. Yeah. And now it'll be like, okay, whose turn is it to pick tonight? What are we going to watch? And it's a 50-50 chance as to whether we're going to pick an action film, a comedy or a romance from the yeah. pair of us. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, so, you know, all of these kind of experiences have opened up, which is really, really mm. nice. Yeah. And it lets me relate who I am as well. You know, when you mm. come back to pick it up, not role models, but seeing yourself in media and things like that, you know, I can mm. see where I've always, I don't like use the term identified as, I think I, I prefer mm. kind of identified with other mm. women on screen. Yeah, yeah. And I can see it really, really clearly now. Mm. And I can mm. see why I identify with those women on screen and the circumstances right. and, and, and everything else, you know, where I've worked things yeah. through. It's, and it's wonderful because you can see yourself represented as kind of who you are, not just as a trans person, mm. but as a woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, really important, mm. you know, to kind of yeah. acknowledge yeah. That, that, that that kind of sits there. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting that you say it sounds like you're – your taste in things rather than it changed it's expanded so and i think probably from when we're young there's a lot of like conditioning we go through when like a lot of roles we adopt as as our identity i suppose and it's like yeah. and i guess with your with your relationship i guess because you've been together so long you know each other well and obviously there is a part of just trying to think how to phrase this your wife obviously knows the real you on some level, maybe may, or maybe she saw or recognized it, even if you didn't, I, I don't know. Something like that is coming to mind. I don't know. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're, um, you're not wrong. Um, I, I actually, mm-hmm. I can give you a, I can give you a really, really good example of this. You know, is mm-hmm. that I do all the DIY house maintenance, things like that. Yeah. Always have done taught myself how to do it yeah and you know and it, it's one of these things i've always done because you know you're the man in the relationship you learn to do it is what you're supposed to do my dad did it her dad did it my granddad did it you got to learn to do it but i always hated it i did it because i had to and that resentment really kind of shone through to the point where yeah, you know, if I was decorating, for example, I wouldn't have anybody help me with any of it. Mm. Everybody just had to leave me alone to get on with it because my mood would be foul. Right. It would be absolutely, it was just like, you know, there was this whole, the gender part of it was part of it. ADHD was part of it with this perfectionist kind of streak and, and you know, this, this mm. having to be in control or what to do with the trauma and all of that. There were a lot of messy things kind of coming together, mm. doing this gendered activity or what I saw as a gendered activity yeah. that I absolutely hated. Mm. Now it's completely different. Now, last year we started work on the garden and my wife helped me with, with some of that. And I've I've did some of it with my dad. And again, I've never worked well with my dad doing this mm. kind of thing, even though he's helped me with a few bits and pieces. Mm. But when I was working with him last year, we got on really well. Wow. Yeah. There was there was there was no real friction there at all. And mm. my wife and I are we're doing our bathroom now. And we're talking mm. complete remodel and absolutely gutting it. And Every week, every weekend, we're going in there and we're doing things and we're doing things together. Mm. And we used to argue like cat and dog when, you know, in the before time. But yeah. we haven't argued once whilst whilst doing it. You know, that, that's how fundamentally I've changed 
because oh, I no longer see it as a gendered activity. It's just a skill, right? Or it's just something you Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so decoupling that no. gendered bit from it. Yeah. I still don't particularly enjoy it. Right. But I've got the skills yeah. to do it and I can do it and with the pair of us doing it together, there's that companionship. Um yeah. done twice as fast kind of thing. And it yeah. works. It just works and it reflects mm. it's a microcosm of actually of our entire relationship really mm. because we've always treated those kind of things as teamwork mm. you know we, we both we both do the housework we both do the cooking we both do the feed mm. you know feeding each other it got a little bit more segregated when when the kids were young but mm. by and large we've done mm. everything on a very much non-gendered basis as much as we could mm-hmm. so and, mm-hmm. I, and i think that was kind of part of that was underlying my, my whole transness kind of thing was that mm-hmm. you know i was in some ways being forced to conform to things but in other ways not in my mm-hmm. home life so yeah. that kind of gets very confusing i think yeah, mm-hmm. you kind of pulled in two different directions um, yeah that makes sense yeah and it it, it takes a while to unravel, unfortunately. Mm. But yeah, yeah it, it's it's you know now compared to previously, yeah. You know, and, and I think this is this is the irony. I think a lot of trans people can can kind of appreciate in terms of coming out, finding yourself, living as who you are, and being much much happier. Mm. Is that that drives other people away? Mm. And, and I think that's really that's really really sad, but. Yeah. For me, it's like okay. Well, you don't want to know me. That's fine. I'm not worried. Mm. Just yeah, go away, and I'll just get on with things. Um, mm. And that reflects kind of, in some ways, how I've been my entire life. Because I've always had to be quite independent, or tried to be independent, and encouraged to be independent. Mm. So that that that's worked for me in a lot of ways, but against me and others you know and it, it, it's mm-hmm. sad when you kind of lose people but yeah you know, other people you find kind of step in and and fill that gap mm-hmm. and the, yeah. the friends i mean, I mean I, i've got you know we, we talked about tastes changing and things changing in hobbies and things you know i've i've mm-hmm. been a lifelong gamer you know mm-hmm. I've, I've been gaming since zx81 days back in the 1980s you know we're talking mm-hmm. 8-bit you know pre-8-bit kind of stuff and mm-hmm. i'm still in touch with most of the guys that i did gaming with you know this, mm-hmm. this kind of group i did some programming and gaming stuff and, and, and whatnot with mm-hmm. and they have all accepted me for who i am nice. bar a couple and mm-hmm. i'm still in contact with all of them Mm-hmm. You know, and we we still talk on Facebook, you know, with stupid memes and things like that. But mm-hmm. you know, my, yeah. my gaming changes of my tastes have changed completely. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, they 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 all play Left for Dead, for example. Mm. You know, the old run around zombie killing game. But I just don't enjoy that stuff anymore mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. all. Whereas I used to really enjoy it. I just don't enjoy that stuff anymore. So mm. I'm very much more kind of into much more slower paced stuff, much more stuff I can pick up and drop and more story driven and um, kind of simulation driven, all that kind of thing. You know, very much mm. more kind of complex and intellectual and strategic rather than bang, bang, shoot, yeah. shooty kind of thing. <laughs> but, yeah. But it still gives us things to talk about, and you know, you know the, the fact that these guys are like, "Nah, you are who you are. Don't really care." Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. just wonderful, you know. It, yeah, it's, amazing. Yeah, uh, and that, and that's on top of all the new female friends I've made as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, be, yeah. Because yeah, you know, again, this this is I think probably the thing I was most terrified about actually, you know. Mm-hmm. And I've made some wonderful friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and it, it's yeah, you know, it, it kind of almost brings me back to kind of when I quit my job because mm-hmm. I luckily got managed to secure a place on a social entrepreneur course, mm-hmm. which was 
about to start around the same time I, I, I quit. So I thought, do you know what? I could do this trans awareness stuff as a, a side business kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, let's get on it and kind of see. So it was kind of really mm -hmm. my first, that was my first social slash educational thing as mm -hmm. myself within a group of people where mm -hmm. I would be myself every day. And, and, and Claire was the only person they'd ever meet. Yeah. Yeah. And I surprised myself by actually securing a place on that course for, you know, to start off with. But that I remember that very first lesson, I'll call it that first meeting. Mm -hmm. And I was the first one there because, you know, ADHD means I'm usually chronically late. Therefore, I always make sure I'm chronically early. <laughs> and I, I was the first one there and waiting. And the group was 99% women. Mm -hmm. whole, whole age rate, whole age range from early 20s through to mid 60s. Mm -hmm. And the first two girls that came, the first two women that came through through the door saw me sitting there on my own, just came straight over and started a conversation. Mm -hmm. As in, you're one of us. Mm -hmm. you know, there was no hesitation around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of the other women did as well. And I'm still in touch nice. with, with all of them as, as, you know, as that group, which you know, was like three mm -hmm. years ago now, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, not family friends, but, but friends of my wife's mm. you know, my wife's best friend you know we we told her about me oh when was this just before covid so it must be about the yeah about september october 2020 i think it was 2019 uh, maybe 2019 20. yeah 2019 yeah. god yeah because that's been going on for two years year. now isn't it it has yeah time <laughs> time is weird yeah <laughs> Because yeah. it was just before COVID kind of hit. It was about four or five months before COVID hit because it was, it was, she had a 50th birthday coming up mm. and yeah, you know, we'd kind of looked at each other and gone, well, look, I'm going as me regardless. Mm. So she needs to know, but we don't want to surprise her. Right. Uh, and as luck would, and as luck would have it, she was popping around to drop a birthday card off for me because my, mm. my birthday is in November. And I was going out to a meeting that day as well. So I was myself that day. So she got told about me and introduced to me on the same day. Oh, wow. <laughs> In the same meeting. Yeah, and that, so that, that same kind of visit. And bless her, she took it all in a stride. You know, she was, she was a bit gobsmacked, understandably, because she's known me since I was 15 years old. Yeah, you know, we've known each wow. other yeah, yeah. for you know, the same time as I've, I've known my wife. And mm. yes, yeah, she, you know, we, she had questions and we, we talked things around and, and, you know, all the kind of usual stuff you'd get, but she was mm. very much um, supportive from the start mm. um, as mm. is her partner. And as a result, I ended up going to my very first social function in the February of 2020, which was like just mm. before COVID hit as myself. And we met, some more of Heather's friends and her friends there. Mm. Uh, and again, again, but I, I, you know, lots of questions, but I was just dragged straight into that female group as one mm. of the women, as one of the girls and made to feel like I belong. Mm. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, I've used the word profound a lot. It is profound. Yeah. That acceptance and that support mm. has just been fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's so freeing being yourself mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, the, the, this party we went to, you know, um, normally prior, you know, I wouldn't get up and dance at a party mm -hmm. yeah. at all. You know, uh, I think the last time I kind of danced at a party was at my own wedding back in 92. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't feel comfortable i think mean, there might have been the odd bit here and there when i was absolutely blind drunk but you know um oh, yeah. as a rule i wouldn't wouldn't get up on the dance floor 
Mm. The fact I've got no rhythm, none with, notwithstanding anyway, but I just <laughs> didn't feel like myself. Yeah, yeah. And Heather and, and Ellen's friend, Rachel, was like, come on, dance floor. And mm. she didn't even drag me up. I was like, yeah, okay then. Mm. And I spent hours on the dance floor. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, you know, because yeah. I was me. And, you know, I wasn't drunk. Yeah. I hadn't, I was driving, so I didn't have a drink that night. And, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't really drunk much since coming out, actually. You know, not that I was a, an alcoholic before or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was like I didn't need it. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the occasional yeah. recreational. And, you know, even now it might be one glass of wine and that will be yeah. about it, really. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I was up on the dance floor all night. Amazing. And, yeah, and my other half, she's she's sitting there chatting, chatting away with her friends. Yeah, and she's like, "No, no, you just get on with it." <laughs> <laughs> How fun is that? If you think about it, really, dancing is, or can be, quite a vulnerable thing because it's an, an, yeah. a self a form of self expression, really, isn't it? And like, there are it obviously, is. if you look at gender roles, like if you're perceived as a guy, then things moves moves that are maybe more fluid or more sexy or something they're not acceptable if you're a, if you're a guy you know yeah. air quotes and yeah there is so much so much going on around that as well wow oh god yeah yeah and this is this is one of the i think the one of the funniest things i found with it you know is this that mm -hmm. you know, as a guy i always felt deeply uncomfortable dancing yeah yeah I, as I said, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, I, I can't carry a tune in a bucket and I've got no sense of rhythm whatsoever, but I just did not feel comfortable because I, yeah, I think the only I was... way that was acceptable for you to dance was in a way that was not you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It was in a way that I found mm. very uncomfortable. You know? Yeah. Makes and, sense. Yeah. You know, I kind of mastered the dad shuffle, as they say, you know, the dad dance. <laughs> Um, but that was about the extent of it, really. But yeah, you know, the, the, this this one time out on the you know on the dance floor before before COVID hit, and it was like, I'm just going to be myself, just move how I feel comfortable moving. Yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, and and it's the same with things like mannerisms and things like that. Since I've come mm -hmm. out as well, you know, I'm I'm very yeah. much more more kind of expressive. I'm 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 naturally feminine. You know, mm. I've had so many people say to me, you know, you're naturally feminine mm -hmm. compared to where you were beforehand. You, it, yeah, I, I used it in my TED talk, you know, it says, uh, you're so yeah. natural, you know, mm -hmm. because yeah. this is who I am. This mm -hmm. is me naturally expressing myself. Um, yeah. And, you know, even though I moved badly on the dance floor, it was mm -hmm. more the way a woman would badly dance rather than a guy <laughs> trying to, into, you, know, you know what I'm saying, you know? Um, oh, yeah. But I was just like, caution to the wind, who cares, you know? And, yeah, you know, there I am mm -hmm. in my heels on the dance floor, bopping <laughs> away with the rest of them and, and having amazing. A, an amazing time, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's so eye-opening kind of navigating this this navigating and crossing this gendered space yeah. in different ways as a, as, as a trans person, you know, you, you do get some real insights into both sides of things, even though you may not mm. kind of really fully understand, although you're trying to conform to one type, you don't fully understand it yeah, because you're suppressing who you really are, which is unacceptable on the other side, you know, so it's mm. like exactly. you get insights into both and yeah, yeah, unpicking that is is kind of messy, but mm. yeah, I think it does kind of give us some valuable kind of cornerstones and touchstones in some ways. Mm. Well, it in, blows in the, it blows the lid things. off, like yeah, like gender roles and how ridiculous they are, really, right? It, it, yeah. Like what is yeah. what is okay, what is not okay, and how you know how we all perform this. Oh yeah, 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 and 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 it's. Yeah. Um, it's very strange kind of navigating that space. Mm. Very strange at times. You know, you know, when you kind of sit there and you look back and you sort of go, why the hell did I do that? And why the hell did I think that? Mm. Because that's yeah. just kind of 
not not gendered at all, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the way we're raised. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's the way society, you know, as I said, going back to the nineteen seventies, that 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 strict segregation of gendered roles, and you know, boys must do the DIY and the car repair, and and mm-hmm. girls do the washing and the laundry, and actually, I did both. Mm. Yeah, which was, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, in some ways, I was kind of forced into doing both, actually, because you know I, I kind of alluded to to, to how Mum treated me, but you know this this mm. was part of part of picking things out and working things through mm. was that she very much treated me in many many ways as a daughter. Interesting. So whilst telling me it was unacceptable to do so you know to be who mm. i was you know right. to express anything feminine so you know i mean I, I've, I've got a brother and a and a younger brother and a younger sister mm. you know my younger brother would get away with stuff that there's no you know normal boy kind of stuff mm. that i would be penalized for mm. you know i would be roped into doing things Partly, I think, because actually I kind of enjoyed them because they were seen as female, feminine, gendered kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. Um, whereas he wouldn't do it. So, you know, I would be the one who got roped into helping out with a cleaning job, Mm. for example. You know, I'd be the one that help out with the laundry and the housework, Mm -hmm. Um, whereas my brother wouldn't and my sister was too young to kind of do so. But it went further than that. You know, I would be the one that, while my brother and sister were kind of shuffled off to a babysitter, I would get taken out shopping with mum while she looked for clothes. Mm. And I would be asked my opinion on what they were like, whether they suited her and things like that. So, Mm. which is not something a boy at the time would have been asked to do. So, Mm. you know, there was this real dichotomy between being treated as a boy in some respects and being treated Mm. as a girl in others Mm. and being treated as a girl fitted me better, but I wasn't allowed to express it. Right. But I was still being used for it. Mm. And that gets massively messy. That's a real screw with your mind kind of situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, um, it's almost abusive in a way, Mm. but I don't think Mm. it was intentionally abusive. Mm-hmm. I think it was just one of these things that where she struggled with things and, and yeah, you know, and all of that kind of got messed up mm-hmm. into it. Um yeah. it it kind of kind of just ended up going that way. And yeah. but you know, as a sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven year old, that's massively confusing. Because you're yeah. being treated You've been treated one way in some circumstances, being treated a different way in other circumstances, and then mm-hmm. being told the way you're being treated differently is unacceptable, even though you're enjoying Yeah, it, it's a mess. Oh. Gender roles and stereotypes and things like that, just it's an absolute mess. Mm. And, you know, but no, actually, it's probably the wrong way of putting it. It's the enforcement of those, the, the yes expectations around them you know stereotypes Mm. and 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 gendered things in themselves aren't necessarily bad Mm -hmm. i think but it's that enforcement and expectation and adherence to which is yeah and that can take a lot of unraveling Mm -hmm. yeah well i mean i noticed that in myself you know and i've i've had a relatively let's say easy gender experience my whole life however (laughs) the whole conditioning and gender roles it like it just it just hurts everyone to be fair it's like it hurts everyone in different ways and I feel like now that more and more people like gender diverse folks are coming out and are being more public about or just being who they are in public um although unfortunately that is risky and it takes it takes courage still it shouldn't have to but it does but I feel like I think why it's so uncomfortable for certain people is because it makes people or it confronts people with this, the ridiculousness of, like you say, reinforcing and policing these gender roles. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I kind of, 
I'd absolutely agree with that. It's just that I, th I think, yeah, trans people existing very much within the gendered society just mm. throws all the rules out of the window. Yeah. Whether we're binary or non binary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yep. it, and it's this whole, um, I, I think I suppose a lot of cisgender people get quite scared because we sometimes make that transition look relatively easy because mm. the way they perceive things, you know, the way, the way kind of a lot of cisgender people perceive things is that, mm. you know, you're, you're going from this one set state, which is preset to another set state, which is kind of preset mm. when actually it's, it's this whole, no, this, this second state is me. Mm. So, I can really easily move from male to female because actually I'm really female. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, we use the word transition a lot, you know, and I, I don't particularly, mm. I'm not particularly keen on the word, to be honest. You know, it, it, mm. it I think it overemphasizes this change of state. Yeah. You know, and this, I think this a lot of people change of probably, being. Yeah, assume it means changing into something different, but what it yeah. really means is changing into like or just letting go of everything that's not you and becoming more yeah. of you. And and yeah, and I, I mean, I I kind of thought about it quite, quite in depth probably a mm. couple of years ago, and mm. and I'm I try to use the term gender alignment now. Oh, I like that rather mm -hmm. than transition because. Ooh. You know, I'm not I'm not nice. transitioning from one sex to another or one gender to another. Right. What I'm doing is, is is taking the trappings of a gendered society, mm. um, whether that be gender expression, roles, or via medical treatment and physical stuff, and you know, in terms of the gendered expectations around particular sex. Mm -hmm. But I'm taking those and using them to align who I am with the expectations of society mm. and the expectations of how I see myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially in terms of the physical side of things, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, the external yeah. stuff is relatively easy. The physical stuff isn't so much, but they both, mm -hmm. they both have the same impact. And it, 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 it's bringing that, that external perception in line with who you are as a person mm -hmm. rather than moving from one state to another. Yeah. So I, I, I think alignment describes it better. Yeah. I like, I like that. And I like learning about how like the word, you know, expanding on the term transition and how like, yeah, I really love hearing your perspective on it. Cause I've, I feel like because of, the conversations I've had with people, I've come to understand it in a different way, and I love how that yeah. keeps you know evolving. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a conversation you find having with with different trans people. You know, you, you, mm. like like the rest of humanity, we're all different. Mm -hmm. You know, every yeah. trans person is different from every other trans person, and mm -hmm. and there's so many reasons and factors for that. It, it, you, you can't really kind of put it into words, mm -hmm. but the underlying experiences are all largely the same. You know, the, the, the commonalities of experience that, that I've found with, with the trans community, but with the ADH community, with the ASD community, and the way all of that crosses over as well, um, mm. and the commonalities of experience, even, even with cisgender women. You yeah. know, that, I, I think that's, that's the one. It shouldn't surprise me but it still does mm -hmm. in many ways. You know? um, yeah. I was, uh, I was at a, an art viewing middle of last year, end of last year. Uh, you know, I was, I was invited along by, by, by someone I know. And all of this art had been done by people who were dealing with cancer and cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. during lockdown. So as, as ways of coping during, during lockdown. Wow. And mm -hmm. there was this one particular piece that I kind of kept coming back to, in, in part because it was a cross stitch. So I was kind of interested in it because I liked doing cross stitch. Mm. But it was, 
it was somebody who had suffered from ovarian cancer, mm-hmm. I believe, if, if, if memory memory serves me. And it was a cross stitch of a of a photograph of of a woman holding a baby. Mm-hmm. So very kind of close up, very kind of you know portrait kind of thing mm-hmm. in black and white, and. It was really moving, but it, 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 I, I kept coming back to it because it kept speaking to me. Mm-hmm. And talking to Rebecca, who had invited me, and you know, she was like, you know, it, she was saying, you know, it talks to me on this level. You know, it's mm-hmm. this loss of motherhood, this not being able to become a mother, mm-hmm. and then everything kind of clicked at that point as to why it was resonating for me, and it mm-hmm. was because I would never have that experience. Yeah. But for a different reason. Mm. And being a father, being a parent is different to being a mother. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, there's this whole, I suppose there's this, there's this something around wanting to carry a child, wanting to actually have a child of your own. You know, that child is part of you mm. that you don't get when you're a father mm-hmm. yeah and it, it and then that was the level it was kind of speaking to me I, it, it was that sense of loss and regret mm-hmm. that you know even though i've had kids and even though i love my kids you know they're not really kids now they're adults but you know mm-hmm. I, you know i, yeah. I love them mm-hmm. there's that i suppose that disconnect there again you know it's that mm-hmm. they're they're not really part of me Mm. and that's yeah. not an experience i'm ever going to be able to have yeah so you know there, there's that commonality of experience that that commonality mm-hmm. of of loss but coming at it from a different direction mm-hmm. and yeah. we had a we had a really good chat about it and she was like i never really viewed things that way but i can see where yeah. where you can you, you you can come at it from that point and i, th- I think it's something that I think we as trans women don't don't talk enough about. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've mm-hmm. got this kind of yeah. habit of bottling everything up still, and and you know, it's seen as um, appropriating womanhood, if you will, because mm-hmm. it's an experience we would dearly love to have, mm-hmm. but we know unless there's some significant advances in medical science, it's not something mm-hmm. we're probably going to be able to experience within our within our lifetimes. And there, there, I think there's, there's, there's a sense of loss that comes with that, a sense yeah. of regret that comes with that. It, it, it mm. is fascinating navigating this space, and you know, it's, um, yeah, I, th- I think probably one of the things I can kind of close on and kind of take away from it, you know, uh, you mm. know, is, um, you know, that change is so profound. That you know, that change is so different on a personal level. You know, is. I've got next to no stories from before that I like to recount about doing things and going places and stuff like that because I was always unhappy. But now, you know, since, since coming out, since that, that photo, since that looking in the mirror for the first time, I've got stories coming out of my ears about enjoying myself and having fun and funny things that have happened because I'm trans and because I'm transitioning and, and, and things like that, you know, as well as, you know, we get hung up on the, um, on the negative stuff, but the positive stuff often gets overlooked, but actually that's the whole point of why, why we transition. That's the whole point of why we align with who we are with everything else it, it's to find that joy in life and i'm not there yeah. myself yet but i'm getting there you know i've done things that i never would have dreamed of you know i've done a tedx talk which you know fantastic experience but if you told me five years ago that i was going to be doing a tedx i would have laughed at you because i just didn't have the confidence mm-hmm. yeah and, that and that, that's the kind of thing it can help and do you know it, it brings mm-hmm. you alive Wow. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing all this. 
with me, Claire. Oh, thank you. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. I mean, I've, I've loved talking to you today and, and in the other conversations. Yeah. Had. And yeah. I'm, I'm so pleased you asked me to, to be a guest on, on your podcast. You can find out more details on the website at 50shadesofgender.com forward slash Claire, which is C-L-A-I-R-E, where you can also read the transcript. And you can find Claire on her website, clairestranstalks.co.uk, and on Twitter at ctranstalks. You can find links on the episode page. Thank you for listening to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. You can find us online at 50shadesofgender.com, on social media, and on YouTube. Again, if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open minded. Amazing. Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's such an English thing, isn't it? Thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> it it really is, fun. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ah, amazing. Wow. God. Oh. Yeah. We, we covered, I mean, we naturally covered everything, you know, that was that was on the list today and like in a different way than we talked about before. So, yeah. Yeah, really but I think it flowed really nicely, actually. It did. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I didn't yeah. have to sort of ask or guide because like, it went naturally, you know, in that way. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah sorry kind of dominated the conversation no it's it's totally fine yeah it just sort of yeah it flowed so that's good yeah yeah it was nice i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed it again new experience yeah. you know yeah it's, yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, mm. it's one of those things that I, i'm up for trying new experiences which is, I, I never really was before mm. yeah and i like yeah I, I will also link to your ted talk seriously I'll also link to your TED talk. I'll embed the TED talk in the um, in the episode page, so I'll do that. Okay. Um, yeah, and yeah. I mean, feel free to use that 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 photo as a, as I said. I think that really kind mm. of underscores that. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that awesome. whole looking in the mirror thing, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. Um, that, that makes sense in a way because if you're there's some noise going on outside. I'm... I hope that doesn't. <laughs> you hear it? I don't know if you heard it or not. Yeah, I, I heard that. Yeah. Oh, you heard it? Okay. Somewhere. I hope they stop soon. Um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, <laughs> alarms going off left, right, and centre. Yeah, I have a I have another call coming up. Um, well, <laughs> I think oh that things brings brings things to a close, doesn't it? <laughs> you know what? It, it probably it probably does. I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah. Rudely interrupted, but <laughs> by nature, not nature, not, not even nature, like by, DIY. By DIY. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness.